right, uh, welcome to my session on wide audio distribution. And um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm an audiobook narrator. Uh, I've been narrating for about five years. I came out of radio. I did NPR radio for seven years and worked with a PBS station. And a couple of years ago, I started Spectrum Audiobook Publishing, where I produce and publish primarily audiobooks and do distribution, and we also have our own distribution channel. So this discussion is gonna get split up into a couple of parts. One where I introduce basically wide distribution and some of the major players and some of the platforms, and then I'll go into a little bit about how to actually do it and some of your tips and tricks, and then at the end, I'm gonna introduce the distribution platform that Spectrum has developed. Anyway, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, good afternoon to everybody on the live stream. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you folks have any questions on the live stream, are they able to post questions in the chat over there? Okay, great, great. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so I start with the word patience because Audible has kind of spoiled everybody a little bit. Um, making it really easy and really quick to get your audiobooks up. And when you go into wide distribution, you're gonna be working on a model that is a little bit more like traditional publishing. So it takes months to get into wide distribution, and so patience is your friend. It really and truly is. And you know, like the slide says, it may not happen in exactly the order that you want it to happen in, but when it does, it, it, I guarantee it will be worth it. Um, a lot of authors who do uh, Amazon, they think that because they are in KU and exclusive, that they also have to be exclusive in audio, and that is not true. They are separate entities, so you can go non-exclusive in audio while still staying in KU or on Vela. So going wide, in, ultimately it means more choice, more choice for your listeners, more choice for you. These are some of the uh, you know, major players in this. Uh, Authors Republic, Find A Way, which sometimes seem to be the same entity. I'm actually not quite sure what the relationship between the two is, but if you use Authors Republic, you often end up on the Find A Way platform. Um, I'm going to treat Blackstone a little bit differently because they have a different model than, you know, some of the other distributors. Uh, Spoken Realms, Spoken Realms is also uh, owned and operated by a narrator, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then down at the bottom there, uh, Ingram Spark. So anybody who's using uh, Ingram for your hardcover or your ebooks, then you're already going to be familiar with them. They just have a very different platform for um, setting up your audiobooks. Um, so these folks are basically known as aggregators. So they aggregate a large number of distribution platforms. And on average, it's 24 to sometimes 40 platforms that come in under an aggregator. Again, with Blackstone sort of being the exception to the rule. So why do you want to go wide? Well, the biggest reason why you want to go wide is because if you're exclusive, then libraries and bookstores cannot carry your books. And if you look at this image, you'll see down there in the little left-hand corner that little Hoopla logo. And during the pandemic, uh, Hoopla borrows absolutely skyrocketed. So if people were in wide distribution, you know, they still continued to make money or increase the amount of money that they made because they were wide instead of just staying on Audible, where people were kind of pinching their pennies and maybe not buying as many books or being careful about how they used their credits. So it really does take three to six months to get established. Um, because everybody always wants to know, you know, how does the money work? And I'll get into this in a little bit more detail. But each, each individual channel under an aggregator, each distribution channel, they have their own royalty structure. 
Um, they include a royalty split, which you're familiar with if you've done Audible. Uh, they have pool play. Pool play is where the listeners pay a monthly subscription, and then all the money that comes in that each month, that is split amongst the authors, so you get a percentage with that. Uh, some of the libraries do pool plus a borrow. So you'll get a percentage for the monthly subscription, plus you'll get, oh, usually it's 45 or 50 percent of whatever the borrow fee. The borrow fee is usually 99 cents. Uh, I've seen it go as low as like 45 cents, you know. Um, and then, of course, you know, their subscription, which pretty much is self explanatory. So I'm a big fan of passive diversified income, which it really is why distribution is. You know, I mean, you put your stuff on there, you can leave it on there as long as you want. Um, you're not locked into a contract. That's, you know, one of the nice things about this is that you retain a ton of control. So you can decide, oh, I just want to put my stuff up there for a little while and see how it does, and then maybe I'll move it to another platform. You can pick and choose what platforms you want to do. You know, um, and you, you really and truly hold the reins with this. Um, and again, you can hire an aggregator to do it, or you can do it yourself, and I'll get into that as well. But, um, you know, under the different kinds of income, you know, and I'm going to talk about library a little bit first, just is the fact that when you're doing the library model, the borrows really and truly add up. And it's, it's really surprising. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always shocked when the numbers come in over the library stuff. Because they can consume more media. You know, it just gives, the, the, everything's wide open for, you know, for the libraries. And the Los Angeles Public Library has said that their borrow rates were up 27% in 2020. So, there you go. You know, yes? I'm sorry? Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, great, great. <laughs> um, when you do wide distribution, one of the other things that you have control of are rolling promos. Because your content is rolling out on multiple platforms and they take different amounts of time to get established on those platforms, if you are doing Facebook ads or uh, you know, Instagram posts or TikTok or any of that kind of stuff, then you can roll all of those promos so that they're coordinating with the different platforms. So this way, you know, you're not only introducing new audiences because of the platforms, you're constantly keeping that book in, you know, search engine optimization, you know, when you're online and you're doing your promos online. Um, and, you know, and the, the, the big final point about the diversified income is the fact that audiobook income is just continuing to grow. So why limit yourself to a single platform or a couple of platforms? You know, they're, they're, I really don't think that there's any reason to, to not do this, but I can understand some of the arguments about why you might not want to. Um, and if you want to ask questions about that, we can definitely get into that. So now that I've kind of done an introduction, um, did anybody have a question about anything I just kind of ran through? Go ahead. Go ahead From again. Class, I'm again. Sorry. So yeah, you mentioned the different aggregators. Do they all distribute to the same retailers or are there differences between them? Do we have to pick more than one aggregator to cover the market? There are differences between them. So, uh, you know, most of them tend to distribute to a lot of the same platforms. So you can pick and choose what you want to do. Like all of them tend to distribute to Audible. But if you're already doing Audible, you just pull that out of your contract, you know, and, and pick and choose what you want to do. Um, some of them do primarily international, you know. Um, some of them primarily do educational or children's. Or So again, you can also filter that by, you know, your genre or the niche target audience that you want to go into. All right. Okay, so like I said, um, an aggregator is basically someone who kind of does it all for you. All right, boy, I can't even read my own slide. <laughs> it's too faint. Um, 
And so they're a larger entity and they have a number of distribution platforms underneath them. Then of course you have your distribution platform. So a distribution platform is Hoopla, Overdrive, Kobo, uh, Libro.fm, Biblioteca, Next Story, any of those. Those are an individual uh, distribution platform and you can always cut a deal directly with them. And then of course, you've got your own DIY. So if you sell through your website or if you're doing a Patreon or you know, those kind of things, you, know, you, you can handle that yourself. And so when you go wide, you can do a combination of all of those things. You're not limited. It really and truly is whatever works for you. And because it takes a while for the content to get in there, you have a lot of time to test, to look at the data, to look at the reporting. And that's one of the nice things, is that the reporting is extremely granular. So you get a lot of data. And you, know, and you can even look at trends over time and you know, take a look at how things are doing and move things around you know, while you're doing all your testing. All right, so pros and cons, all right. Um, you know, the basic formula is numbers plus time equal larger income. So when you work with an aggregator, you're going to make the smallest amount of money, but it's pretty much hands off. So most of the work will be done by them. They will continually add platforms. Um, aggregators always take a percentage, and when you have issues with any of your books, you know, it does say, take some time to resolve, usually because they're very large entities. And so, you know, they've got a lot of clients and it's gonna take a little while for your stuff to get resolved. Um, if you go straight to the distribution platforms, you're gonna make more money, but you have more work because you have to do the individual contracts. You have to upload each individual book. You have to do the Onyx files. You have to do all the metadata. You're, you know, you're going to have to do all of that. And you're responsible for adding new platforms. And you know, that can become a full-time job in itself, just researching all the platforms that are out there. Because every time we turn around, somebody else starts a new distribution platform. And um, because you're dealing with it directly, you can often get your issues resolved fairly easily. Yeah, you know, and pretty quickly. Because again, you hold the contract directly with the distributor. And then of course, with DIY, you know, if you're writing full time, you know, you're probably gonna need an assistant to, to help you with, you know, DIY. If, you're, if you've got a, a, a website and a Patreon and, you know, you're doing book boxes and all of that, you know, that can all get very complicated. You know, um, and it can take away from your writing time, but you control your income 100%, you know. So there's lots of pros and cons to doing this, but I would still say overall that the pros outweigh any kind of cons because, you know, in my mind, you know, all money that comes in is good money. You know, so. <laughs> um, all right, so again, um, Aggregators have a full range of distribution services. Uh, like I mentioned before, Find a Way is also Authors Republic. Sorry about the text kind of sliding around here. Um, it worked better on my desktop. Um, Ingram Spark, they also do ebook and hardcover. So if you're already with them, it's fairly easy to add Core Source, which is their audiobook platform, onto your account. And they will regularly send you emails and say, hey, we just signed Storyteller, we just signed, like they just signed Spotify. They just signed Spotify two weeks ago. So they'll send you an email and say, hey, do you wanna be on Spotify? Here's your agreement. And you just sign another contract and boom, when you, you know, when you set up your, your books, they'll automatically add it to that new platform. So Blackstone. Blackstone is really the only aggregator that is still doing CDs. So if you've seen on Amazon when you've seen a book listing and they're still showing CDs on there, it's highly likely that they've used Blackstone. The last one here is a little hard to read. It's Zebralution, Z-E-B-R-A-L-U-T-I-O-N. And they handle Napster and Spotify and Google Play. Um, you know, they're really kind of in the music streaming space. But they've 
coordinated it to work with audiobooks because the music streaming space had a real issue with the fact that most of them were set up for musicians, so you could only load 12 or 15 tracks at a time. And as we all know, you know, a lot of books are going to have a lot more chapters than 12 or 15. And so you, you really couldn't put audiobooks up there unless you completely re-edited it and engineered it so that you had extremely long tracks and then the platform still couldn't work with it because the tracks were too long. So, but that's one of those things that's, again, starting to change, you know, and all of those platforms are really coming online. And Zebralution does international. So now you've got your smaller, uh, uh, I wouldn't say smaller distributors, but you come down a step from aggregator to distributor. So Hoopla is obviously library, Overdrive is library, Kobo is Walmart, um, Libro.fm, uh, they are tied into the indie bookstores. So if you really want to see your stuff get into independent bookstores, you, you definitely want to be on Libro.fm. Uh, uh, I know Google Play is here at the conference, so you know a lot of folks have had a chance to talk to them, and I know the guy is still walking around, so you know you should just go right to him. But <laughs> um, uh, Storytel, Storytel is international, and it handles very few countries. But one of the things I like about it is the performance on it is really phenomenal. It's Sweden, Poland, Denmark, Norway, and uh, and and I just you know I see. Uh, great, great numbers come in every single month on Storytel. So, uh, I, you know, I really recommend if you're going to do direct deals that you include that one. All right. Um, so your timelines, three to six months. Three to six months is, is how long it takes for most of these folks to ingest your books. So they send you an Excel file and you have to fill out a ton of metadata on them. And I think I've got, well, I'll, when, we, when I stop this, I'll pop up one of those because I think I brought one of them with me. And you have to do it for every single book. You send in the metadata. Then you have to FTP up all the audio files and your book covers. And then over the space of a few months, they start ingesting all your data and then your books will start appearing. Um, and it takes three to six months for it to appear on the major platforms. After six months, it starts appearing on the smaller platforms like Gloss or Publica or, or you know, Hummingbird, you know, uh, Next Story, uh, Scribdy. You know, um, it, it takes quite a while for it to start appearing on those. But also, the six to eight month period is when your payouts finally start appearing. So you're going to see because most of them pay quarterly. Some of them pay biannually, and you'll start to see a payout for the first month that your book's listed. Um, from eight to 10 months, do, 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 that's when your internationals are going to start appearing. So uh, again, this is why I say you have to be patient, because it's not like Audible, well, they've gotten so much better now, but you, know, you pop stuff up on Audible, and usually within a couple of months, it's up there and it's for sale. Um, you know, but with this stuff, you really do just have to kind of hang in there and wait. And then at the 10 to 12 month mark, that's where you can really start seeing how your sales are doing. That's where, you know, that's where you can start looking at pie charts and, you know, bar charts and really, you know, deciding, is this the right aggregator for my books? Is this the right platform? Um, you know, I mentioned Storytel. Storytel does a great job with anything that is science fiction. Anything that's science fiction. Find a way, find a way. I, I, I see, you know, romance, paranormal, mystery thriller. Those things crank on those, you know, on those aggregators. So, again, you know, it's all about paying attention to your data and seeing what performs best. You're not going to be able to read this. It doesn't matter. It's, it's on their website. But, you know, this is Ingram Sparks' list of distributors. So it's, it's, and, you know, and it breaks it down by whether or not it's library or, you know, um, direct to digital or, and retail. Um, this is Find a Way's list of distributors for audio. And you'll see, the, uh, and you'll be able to get a copy of this because I know they're giving out copies of the PowerPoints and, and you'll see there's a lot of overlap. But again, 
you can customize this and you can choose whatever you want to do or not do. Okay, I said I was going to treat Blackstone a little bit differently, and it's because, one, because Blackstone still does CDs, and because Blackstone has their own platform, which is Downpour. And you will see that, you know, Find A Way puts stuff out on Downpour, and it means that they're going through Blackstone. So the money gets a little muddy, because, <laughs> because Find A Way is going to take a percentage, but Blackstone is taking a percentage from Find A Way. So you're going through two layers before you even see any royalties. If you decide that you want to go direct with Blackstone, they require you to do iTunes and Amazon exclusive with them. So if you've already got audio on uh, Amazon, you you know, and you're doing a new series, you wouldn't be able to do it through your account. You would have to do it through Blackstone if you want to be on their platform. If you're going through Find A Way, you don't have that issue. It's just if you're going direct through Blackstone. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, this is the end of the second part. <laughs> Questions at this point? Yes? Is it, yeah, cool. Um, so for Blackstone and audio CDs, do you see audio CDs still being a useful thing to have, or is it just all digital and that's how it is now? People do buy them still. Um, do they buy a lot of them? Uh, not really. Um, my personal experience was, and you know, I worked in a music studio for a while, so I have a little bit, you know, of a different background with this, but I was really unhappy with the quality of the CDs when I saw them come from Blackstone. The, um, the uh, uh, cover inserts and stuff were very poorly printed. Um, the CD itself was okay, but it was, it was very plain. It didn't, you know, it didn't carry over any artwork. You didn't have any control over it. That was the other issue. They had you just give them a blurb and the front cover art and you had no control over everything else that went on it. And so um, I wasn't particularly pleased with it. But I do know people who regularly do CDs. I know people who still use CDs. So yeah, you know, it's, it's still out there for a reason. <laughs> oh, we gotta wait for the, ah, Chris has got it. All right, go. Real quick on the CDs, what I've seen on that is there's some market for that as gifts. Because a lot of people still don't like to give somebody something they can't hold, but they'll give them a CD. Um, but I had just a quick question on when you had the categories and you had the DIY. With the DIY, are you talking about, okay, I'm just going to sell a download from my website? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. And there's somebody in the back, too, so. <laughs> no, I probably won't use the mic. I'm pretty loud. I'm pretty loud, too. Mine was just a follow up to the to the CDs, um, you know, uh, I believe it's Tantor and or Midwest Tape, you know, they, they have more salt, like the, the, the CDs are more solid, uh, you know, the, the packaging is better, um, whereas the, the Blackstone packaging that I've seen when it comes in for CDs that we've, that we've done yeah. is like cardboard type. And yeah. then, and then um, uh, you know, it also depends on the age of the demo. Who, you know, when you have, if you have audio, if that audio is going to be for people who are over 60, then they're most likely going to use CDs. Right. Yep. They're not going to use an app. If they're younger than that, then they will use an app. So it's kind of the homework you have to do. What's the, what is the demo? And are you willing to do enough to train the people to use an app in order to cultivate that listener? I have really three quick questions. The first is you mentioned data, pulling data. You're talking sales reports like from McGroom mm -hmm. Spark. Um, the second question is uh, do any of these distributors uh, promote or um, advertise for you when you go on their platforms? And the third one is the, can you give any kind of breakdown or percentage of revenue for these different distributors? Um, I do business management for my wife's books. That's why I'm asking these questions. But because uh, I've done Ingram Spark and we've done a, one of the largest distributors and it's a huge difference in sales. Okay, let, 
Let's start with question number one. And by the way, I'm recovering from a concussion, so giving me three questions just killed me. So let's, let's do question number one. <laughs> so go ahead with question number one, please. Just, uh, question one was where you're pulling your data from. And I, I mean, I've seen sales reports from Ingrid Spark, and whether it's a library sale or whether it's some other different type of thing. Do all of these distributors or aggregators provide you with that a monthly report or not? Yes. So, um, so I've actually pulled this up because I, you know, I, I knew you would want to see it. So I did pull up one of the distributors so that you can, so that you can take a look at it. And I'll walk through this. And that's what I was going to do after the questions. Okay. So, okay, question second one two. is, do they self-promote for you no. or advertise no. at all? Like nope. other, okay. Nope. And the last one is, do you have like a rough breakdown of percentage of what they take? Like you mentioned Ingram Spark and the percent of royalties that you get. I cannot release that data because it's specific to the contract that you sign with them. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. All about it, yeah. I just have one question. Sure. Um, for if some, if an author is going to go use an aggregator, would you recommend typically just picking one aggregator, or do authors use multiple aggregators? They they often use multiple. You just have to really pay attention to the exclusivity clauses that you know they have in their contracts, so that you're not running afoul of something. And again, it usually ends up having to do with Audible. Big surprise. So. <laughs> Go ahead. So, honestly, I'm still not sold, um, even a little bit. Uh, okay. Is there data on a percentage of, what percentage of the market is Audible, I guess, as opposed to all these other, agri all these other dis distributors? The last report that the Audio Publishers Association put out uh, with this information was in 2019. Um, I haven't seen, you know, and obviously we have to take the pandemic into effect. So when the next report comes out, it's probably going to be a little wonky. But they were reporting 41% of audiobook sales were audible and everything else was wide distribution. Yeah, okay. Because um, it's still, because if you go exclusive with audible, you get more royalties. Um, I believe. Um, like it's like 40% versus 25% or something like that. And to me, the math just doesn't really add up because like with Hoopla, like I, I, I have one book that's wide and then everything else is exclusive. Um, and it seems like if I sell 10,000 audiobooks in a month, it seems if I was taking that down to 25% as opposed to 40%, it, it You're doesn't... asking, are you going to make it up on the other platforms? Right, and I don't think, I mean, I know it's genre dependent, um, and I, 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 it seems kind of risky, I, I, mean, I don't know if it's risky, but especially in a genre that's super time dependent, um, where you, when you talk about it, it takes a while for right. them to aggregate so, all over the place. You know, and you, so you bring up an excellent point, which is that if you are in a rapid release genre, then where wide distribution works for you is back catalog. To, to just continue to lift your back catalog, things that have slowed down, things that aren't performing as well. You know, but you know, I would agree with you completely that it would be, you know, and now that Audible has changed their rules, Audible has changed their rules, so after 90 days, you can go into non-exclusive. So you can take your bump you know, that your, your boost you're going to get from Audible, and let's say you want to do it for 90 days, or you want to do it for a year, or even two years, and then you can say, you know what, this book isn't performing that well, I'm going to pull it into non-exclusive and send it out wide. So, is that, is that answered? Sure. <laughs> do library borrows count as sales to some extent? Yes. So how the library borrows work, is, and, and this has to do with how much control you have over your pricing. Um, when you do wide distribution, you price for three different models. You price for retail, which is your regular consumer. Then you price for agency, 
which basically are other platforms that are going to carry your book. And then you price separately for what are called rental goods. And that's library. And you always price your library higher than anything else because they're going to buy one copy and then do digital borrows against it. So you get, you actually get a sale of the book every time a library buys a book and then you continue to get library borrows against it. Yes. Do you need to have a separate ISBN for uh, audiobooks that are retail and audiobooks that are for uh, rental goods? You can use the same one. And you can actually use uh, your ISBN that Audible gives you. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a paperback or a hardback with your ebook and they give you an ISBN for free, you can go ahead and use that on wide distribution. They don't, make, they don't make you buy a separate one. But if you're going to go Audible first, exclusive, and then go wide, and it takes months to do the wide, can you start the process? Yes. So you can go because ahead, at any I'm, time, you can pause it. That's the one nice thing is that uh, a lot of them say, okay, you know, let's say, let's say you get a, a book bub and all of a sudden your audio starts going crazy because your ebook has gotten a book bub and you're, you know, you're selling a whole bunch on Amazon. You're like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to go wide. I want to, you know, keep getting that, you know, sweet 40%, you know, um, you can go ahead and put it in pause and they will put a hold on doing any distribution. All right. So you can yeah. go ahead and when you got that book ready to go, you can go ahead and start, put it solo the exclusive on audible and at the same time be putting it to the you can or you can but here here's the problem with that is you run the risk of the aggregator actually getting it up there fairly quickly and if they do then you're going to run into an issue with audible because you you can't have it on both the platforms so i wouldn't i wouldn't do it right when the book comes out but i would wait past that 90 day period on Audible, and then I would start the process. Anybody else? Okay, um, I've pulled up Storytel's dashboard, um, and basically um, how they work is it's by listening hours. So you get uh, you get pool play uh, for listening hours, and you can you can filter it so you can choose. Um, right. Hope the internet isn't going to crap out on me here. All right, so you can, you know, basically change change your data and say, okay, I want to look at the last quarter, and we'll go ahead and look at the last quarter just for fun, and um, and so you're going to see here, you know, that oh, it's it's still thinking. Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up. <laughs> And it looks like it hasn't, nope, it hasn't picked it up. It's just, it's just covering a week. I don't know why it's doing this. Let's try the last 30 days and see if it will do its thing. Okay, there we go. There we go. There's some numbers. So it shows you basically your top listening days, um, and you can plan promos around that as you start gathering data, because you really and truly are going to start seeing some patterns. So over a month, you know, it's going to track, and you're going to see that on certain days you're getting little to no listening time at all, like on a Saturday. You're not getting any listening time, but boy, you know, on Sunday you got a ton of listening time. It's going to show you your top categories, and then it's going to break it out by the actual book, and it shows you um, the countries, you know, that it was, that it was sold in, and then you're going to get a total number of hours. And that way you can kind of figure out, oh, hey, I've increased my hours. Because it will tell you that on your dashboard. You know, oh, you've increased your hours by 100% or 300% or 400% over the last month. So. so right now I'm down for the week, but that's because I'm here. I'm <laughs> not out promoting. <laughs> You know, but again, um, they have a rating system, but it doesn't have reviews. So Storytel does not offer reviews. Some of the other platforms do, but Storytel happens to be one that doesn't. Um, and in terms of, 
putting the books into their system, Um, is anybody here familiar with Findaway's passport? Have you done Findaway already? I'm at five minutes. Oh boy! All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump. But feel free to ask me a ton of questions because I don't do anything after this. All right, I'm gonna really quickly introduce um, a new distribution platform that Spectrum designed. And what it is, is it is connected TV. Uh, I basically call it like the, oh great, not responding. That's what I mean. Um, it is like Netflix for audiobooks. So Spectrum has the first uh, digital channel on Roku, Amazon Fire Stick, and Xbox for audiobooks. And you can use it either through a smart TV or an actual device. Maybe some of you folks have seen the hockey pucks that uh, you can get for Apple TV. And Although we're not doing Apple TV. There's huge exclusivity issues around Apple TV, so we're not even going to try pushing audiobooks there. And again, these are your three main players. And most of the time you can port them, if you've ever used one, you can port them through different parts of your house. Roku's have been in the space the longest. They've been there since 2006. They have over 51 million users in the United States. They cover 18 countries. They just added Germany a week ago. So on our Roku channel, you can search by keyword, author, or narrator. The system retains bookmarks. You can create watch lists and playlists. There are two different ways that authors get paid on this platform, which is either um, advertising-based, where two ad pods run, one at the beginning of the book, one at the very middle of the book during a regular chapter break, or there is a monthly subscription. So it's basically a combination of pool play, and then 70% um, of the advertising revenue goes to the authors. Uh, the audience for this is mostly cord cutters, you know, folks that are not doing cable, uh, folks that want, you know, more media. These are the kind of folks that, that use all these channels. Niche channels rule on Roku. Um, I actually have a background in this. Um, I do a lot of video production, and I was a beta developer for Roku back in 2006. So... Um, this is something that I actually really enjoy doing, and I loved being able to combine audiobooks and, you know, OTT over the top platforms. So, um, this is going to be a little difficult. That, well, actually, you probably can see it better than I can, <laughs> which is that the users are continuing to grow. I mean, the, you know, the uh, graph starts in 2015, um, and uh, Lightman Research Group did a study, and 80% of TVs uh, in homes in the U.S. have at least one CTV device. Two minutes? All right. I already mentioned that the platforms that it's going to be on. Uh, this is a little promo thing that I had at my booth, so you can ignore that for right now. Come on. Okay. All right, we're going to jump out of there. Hopefully. Escape. Okay, now I get to do control alt delete. <laughs> Can you tell I'm impatient? <laughs> oh, that didn't work. Great. I love technology. I absolutely love it. All right, and so now it's going to spin. Um, but I. Uh, when I can, I'm going to jump really quickly to a minute-long video that shows you exactly how the channel works. We did a beta test for six months. Uh, we had 40 authors that signed up for the beta test, um, including a couple of people in this room. Thank you very much. We really appreciated it. Um, and we had some fantastic people who spent a ton of time checking over every single book and making sure that they play and do, and do their thing. Um, we did a ghost launch of the channel, and basically, uh, it was really it was just not behaving. Uh, let's see if I can pull up the video. There we go. Um, when we did the ghost launch, 
We didn't even tell anybody we were going to launch. We just did it to see what would happen and see what kind of data would happen. And we had over 12,200 installations of the channel just from people searching for audiobooks on Roku without a shred of promotion. And we had over 200 people go ahead and sign up for a monthly subscription even though the channel isn't live. So, you know, um, with you know, that many people in the Roku, you know, viewing space, 51 million, I think there's tons of potential to grow. So this is a very short video that will show you a little bit about um, how you load the channel. Um, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is your typical Roku screen. Um, let me see if I can fast forward. You see, it's not even going to do anything. It's just going to lock up on me. This is just evil. Um, I've run out of time. I apologize about this. Um, I am definitely available for questions. So, you know, please snag me in the hallway and we'll, uh, you know, I'll answer anything you want. I'll keep the laptop going and once it decides to behave, you know, I can, I can show you anything you want to see. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for your patience with the technology. <laughs>